Hey guys, Greg here. Let's solve subsets, lead code number 78. So we're given an integer array of nums of unique elements, and we need to return all of the possible subsets, aka the power set. So a subset of an array is a selection of elements, possibly none of the array. And the solution set must not contain duplicate subsets. And you can also return the solution in any order. So basically what it's saying here is that if you're given an array of numbers, one, two, three, we need to return all possible subsets. So you could choose no numbers. You could choose just one, just two, or just three. You could choose two numbers. So you could choose one and two, one and three, or two and three, or you could choose all of the numbers. So one, two, three. And in total, you'll see here, we actually have eight solutions. So we're getting eight because we'll see the math shortly. But since there is three different numbers here and you could choose or not choose each number, you could actually get two to the three, which is equal to two times two times two, which is equal to eight many solutions. So we'll start our solution as empty. So there's nothing so far. And let's say we're considering the number of one right now. So since it is subsets, we could either choose that number or we could not choose that number. So that basically means each time we're going to have two different branches. So when we draw lines like this, it's really branches of this imaginary tree. So the left path, we're going to represent this left path as basically don't choose. So I'll put an X there as in don't choose the number. And this path will be choose that number. So on this level, we're considering the value of one. Over here, if we don't choose it, our solution is still empty. And over here, if we do choose it, okay, well then so far our solution is the list of one. So at this level here, we're considering the value of two. And so if we don't pick that number, we still have nothing. And if we do pick that number, then we have just the list of two. And over here, if we had instead picked one, well then here, if we don't pick two, then we end up with still just one. And if we do pick two, then we end up with one and then two. We always just place that new number on the end, like an append operation if we choose to pick it. Okay, so the last row here is where we are considering the value of three. So over here, if we picked nothing, well, if we don't pick three, then we don't pick anything. And this is actually gonna be a final solution. Over here, we are actually going to have just three. Over here, we have two, but we don't pick three, so it's just two. Over here, we do decide to pick three, so we get two and then three. If we don't pick it, it's just one. On the right path, it is one and then three. And finally here, we get one, two, and finally one, two, and also three. Okay, so those are kind of in order here, all of our solutions. And we know that these are solutions because basically here, if we are considering the value of one, here we're considering two, here we're considering three, those are really all of the numbers we have here. And so we could basically have like an index i, for example. So at the first level, i was here, then it was here, and then it was here. And at the very end, we'd actually get out of bounds. So this shows all of the different solutions that we'd get but we didn't really draw it in the order that the computer would actually go through the solutions. So here is how the computer would do it. It has to do these things one at a time, basically going to do a DFS. And so that's why we did a lot of DFS tree problems because this is going to come up a lot. So the path that the computer would take here is basically starting at this empty list, and then we are going to tell it to go left first. And left is don't pick the number, okay? So basically, if we're considering the value of one here, well, we're going to not pick it, and so we end up at empty. We are going to do the same thing again, and so we're over here. We are then going to go left again. We do not pick two, and so we end up over here. Same thing again. We actually go over here, and we don't pick three. That is when our index would then go out of bounds after that and so we need to backtrack it's called recursive backtracking because our function is recursive and when we hit a kind of solution here it is then time to go back up so we can do the other stuff so we go back up here we are then going to go down here we do all that stuff we come back up here we then go over here and then it's time to go right from here. So then we go over here, we go here, we go back up, and then we go to the right, we go back up. And from here, we basically just do this order here where it looks like this. So we'd visit all of these nodes in this order. This is just a traditional depth first search. 
Now, the way we're going to go about this is basically having two global lists here. We'd have result, which is eventually going to be basically the list of all of these solutions. It's going to have our full answer, the thing we actually want to return. And we'd also have another global list, which I'm going to call Sol. And this is going to be a template for pretty much all of our recursive backtracking solutions. They're very similar. And so Sol is basically this list here. It's a global that we're going to change basically by appending numbers. So appending means take a number and pop means to go basically back up here because we need to undo that change that we made. That's the recursive backtracking part. So at the beginning here, both of these lists are empty. And so he we are here. We then decide to go left. Left, we don't do anything. We go left, we don't do anything. We go left, and then we hit kind of this leaf node here. Okay, this is a solution because our index is going to go out of bounds. And so we say, okay, well, result actually has a solution here. We basically give result here a copy of solution. Then for Sol, we're going to backcheck up here. And then here we say, actually, let's pick three. Let's decide to pick the value of three. So when we do that, we temporarily append to Sol the value of three saying, okay, we've picked that number. Then we go and call our function and recurse down that path. And we say, oh, we actually hit a base case. And so same thing with result over here, we're going to give result a copy of solution. And so now it also has the list of three. Now to properly recursively back backtrack this part, we actually need to pop three. We decided to pick three here, but to recursively backtrack, we need to actually pop three by saying, no, no, we are going to undo that change that we did, which allows us to go back up here. So it's very important to understand that we undid the change that we made while going back up. That is the recursive backtracking part of this. So when we go back up here, we are considering now the value of two, we decide to pick two. And so we temporarily append to solve two. We are going to go to the left here. We hit a base case. And so result gets the list of two. We go back up and we say, actually, let's also use the value of three. And so we append three as well. So we get this, and then we are going to append that solution copy to result. You'll see why I'm saying copy in a moment. I'll explain that in Python. Then when we go back up here, we want to say, okay, let's actually pop that from Sol. So we are going to undo the fact that we used three. And then we are also going to undo the fact that we used two. So that when we're at this level again, we are completely fresh. That way when we're back up here, we can then go down this path. We would start to go down over here and we'd end up appending the solution of one. And we'd end up going down this path to basically fill up all of the possible solutions. And then at the end of this, we could return res. Okay, so let's code the solution up. Okay, so we'd start this off by getting n is equal to the length of the numbers. And in these recursive backtracking solutions, you'll almost always see we write res and sol is equal to an empty list each. Okay, so they are both going to start as these global empty lists, where result is basically the thing we're going to return at the very end. And solution is kind of one at a time, all of these different partial solutions that we have. Now we're going to define a function which we'll call backtrack, and it takes an index. So basically, Basically, at the very beginning, we'll call this, and I'll just do pass for now so you can see it, we'll end up calling backtrack on zero. And that means just start it at the very first index. So consider the value of one first. And after it does that, it's going to go and traverse the whole imaginary tree, generate all of our solutions and store them in res. And from there, we're actually going to be able to just return res. So let's write this backtrack function. So we know we're at a base case or basically a leaf node if i is equal equal to n. So that is immediately when our index goes out of bounds, when we are basically at the end of the array here, that's when we're at a base case. And all we need to do is just result dot append a solution copy. Notice that I'm saying solution copy, because if you just wrote Sol here, that would just give res a reference to Sol. You don't want a reference. You want basically a snapshot in time of what solution is actually storing. So you need to do this, which is a copy of what solution is. And from there, there's really nothing more we can do here because our index is out of bounds. And so we're just going to return. Now from here, there's basically two different paths that we want to go down and to go down the left path first, which is don't pick don't pick nums at i. So basically, we're considering nums at i, this is going to be don't pick it. And so we literally just say, Okay, let's move on. Let's call backtrack on the next index and deal with that and see what happens. But then after we go down that whole path of not picking nums at i, we should also go down the path of 
pick nums add i. And by pick it, we need to do three things. We need to first actually pick the number, which means on sol, okay, let's append nums add i. We just decided to use that number. Let's now deal with that. And so we kind of just move forward here. And so we call backtrack on i plus one. Now, after we call this function here and we return back to this stage here, we want to undo the fact that we picked nums at i. So here we temporarily pick it saying, okay, let's pick it and move on. But now we're back here and we want to recursively backtrack, meaning undo these changes that we did. So that just means solution.pop. So that's going to pop that exact same number that gets appended over here. And that is actually our code. So if you were to run and submit that, that is going to work. Okay, so let's talk about the time and space complexity of this. And for that, we should go back to the drawing board for a moment. So regarding the time complexity here, well, let's basically count all of these things that we're getting, because that's basically each call of the function. So we have one here, we have two at this level, we have four at this level, and we have eight at this level. Seeing a pattern? Yep, that's right. If there was actually four numbers here, so if we had a four, then that last thing would be 16. So in other words, this level is basically two to the zero many, this is two to the one, this is two to the two, and so over here it is two to the three. It is causing a doubling effect because of these two branches, we are basically doubling every single level. And so because of that, you could say that this is roughly a two to the n solution. So this would be big O of two to the n. Time complexity tends to be a little more lax when you're talking about these recursive backtracking solutions because it generates such a massive tree. Uh, luckily for subsets, this is a known mathematical problem. And so it is roughly going to be two to the n here. Okay, so that is the time complexity of this solution. What about the space? Well, of course we are storing all of this stuff, but that's part of the problem. And so we're not really gonna consider that as too much extra space. Really the space that we're getting is from the recursion. Recursion depth takes up space because you have to store these call stacks. And so what is the depth of this recursion? How far could it go? And so the depth of our recursion is basically just going to be however many numbers we have. So if we have n numbers, then the space complexity of this, it's going to take up roughly big O of n space due to the recursive call stack. I hope this was helpful, guys. Drop a like if it was, and have a great day. Bye-bye.